He's trained in Hanover as a doctor, um, then went to the US for a research project, and, um, went and then founded uh, one of the most successful German startups, ResearchGate. And I have followed this um, story quite some time already, and I find it phenomenal what you guys did, and I'm really happy to have you here on stage now and talk about your story. We are also talking about future of science, future of um, data science, and um, also about a guy who already knew in, back in school that he's going to do something very big. Welcome on stage, Iad Madis. Hi. Wohin? So is it, is it true that you decided uh, when you were 14 that you are going to win the Nobel Prize yes. sometime later? Yes. So um, ex explain me. So did you not have friends? And uh, No, I also had friends. Yeah. Um, I brought some friends even today to this conference. Um, no, but I, I, we were in school and we, uh, we slept one night in the library and everyone was like taking books and we should read books. And I picked um, an HIV, like a virus, book about viruses because I was interested in viruses and then the uh, teacher asked me one day later okay what did you read and what's your goal in life and I said you know I, I want to win the Nobel Prize I want to fix um, the HIV problem yeah right so so what did your schoolmates say well uh, the same as my brother saying you know I'm I'm a little bit crazy I right. should maybe pick different goals Yeah. Okay, so but when, when you look back now, I mean, um, this goal is pretty far away because you found a research gate when sometime in 2008. Yeah, correct. And um, so you don't do very much science anymore. So how, how oh. are you going to win the Nobel Prize? Yeah, I think uh, research gate itself is science, and I think enabling other scientists to do um, more efficient research and hopefully let them win the Nobel Prize has became my goal uh, in life now to enable other scientists to win the Nobel Prize. Yeah. Okay. Um, when, when you read about um, um, ResearchGate, um, journalists are always writing, okay, it's like a Facebook for scientists. But when you dig deeper, it's, it's more. It's more like a disruption of the way scientists are working together. Um, what is it really, and what do um, scientists do in the morning when they log on onto ResearchGate? Yeah. So, as I said before, I was a scientist myself, so I knew how science works. You sit in your lab, you do research, and then you generate a lot of data. Um, and 90% of that, what you generate in research is basically failed stuff which didn't work. So you try to, uh, I don't know, culture a virus and then the virus doesn't grow and you think immediately, damn, that's a bad result. Um, but every result in science is a result. And that is something we try to change with ResearchGate. So when ResearchGate was founded in 2008, um, together with my friend Sören, we were both frustrated with the fact that We do a lot of research, and most of the research we do is redundant because I know that other people already have done it, um, and we're just repeating the mistakes of others. Um, and this is when ResearchGate was founded, and since then it has grown to the most important and biggest social network for science in the world. Yeah. Right. Is there an example where you, uh, uh, that explains the way ResearchGate works in yeah. that way? So there are many examples in many different areas, but just last week I think that's a pretty exciting example. There was a scientist in uh, Mainz, um, Herbert Lutz, who, who is the deputy director of the Natural um, History Museum in Mainz. He, was, um, he found teeth from uh, primates in Germany, which are roughly 10 million years old. Um, and he, first of all, did not believe it, because our current theory says that the first primates, the first human-like uh, creatures were in Africa for 0.5 million years ago. So this whole theory changed in whole, this whole topic around we have to rewrite our history because now he published also this result in a preprint on ResearchGate. So he said, hey, this result has to go out immediately. I don't want to wait um, to publish this in a journal magazine. I want to publish this immediately into, into the scientific community and make that public to everyone in the world. Um, it, yeah. it has been covered all over the world. I mean, um, British media, American media was covering that. But could you, could you dig a bit deeper and explain how, um, how, how that worked? Did he publish on ResearchGate? Other um, um, scientists joined in? No, so what, how that worked is he wrote, um, so he did this, or he find that teeth, and then he started writing an article and said, before I publish this in a magazine, I'm creating, you know, you have your profile on ResearchGate, there's your projects, and he said, okay, I'm 
publish this result directly into my profile. And what we do then within ResearchGate, we understand the content, we know what the content is about, we know that this is about X, Y, Z, and then we try to suggest this, recommend this to the right scientists within our community again, which then enable then other scientists to give feedback in real time to his findings. And this is how the core concept of ResearchGate is, that you as a scientist have your profile, you put everything what you create on a daily or weekly basis into your profile, make that accessible to other scientists, and then there, by that you're enabling other scientists to collaborate with you in real time. And again, this is changes then how you make scientific breakthroughs. But who's we in that in that um, concept? Because I mean, you have how many hundred? Three hundred. Three hundred employees, but um, um, we is algorithms, right? Yes, algorithms, algorithms written by people, right? <laughs> right, okay, so, but uh, they, so I publish uh, something, the algorithm understands, okay, this is, a, this is about teeth, and yeah. that's very exciting, and all, all the other um, archaeologists or whoever will, will get it um, recommended, yeah. like yeah. in the Facebook news feed? Yeah, so we, um, currently we still have a news feed concept. I'm not sure if the news feed concept in general is the right concept. I think news feeds in general in the world are pretty waste of time. Um, I'm an anti-newsfeed person, and then we're trying to find something. You don't use Facebook. I, I have to, right? It turned to why? Uh, it is became some sort of a LinkedIn for me. Okay. Uh, so Facebook became my LinkedIn. Like um, Sing. Oh, okay. No, no, I don't <laughs> want to get worse, but you know, um, no, but. <laughs> No, right. but I think the, the concept of a feed is, is something which is a little bit something we want to revisit again. In science, we, wanna, we don't want to waste your time. We want to show you like these three, four, five, six items we think you should read. Um, and that's you know, similar to a feed, but it's rather like a finite number of uh, items you should consume and then go back to your research. Okay. Um, and we have within ResearchGate, you have your profile, then you create a project where you put your stuff in, and then we use this data to recommend to this to the other scientists within the network, within their feed, or however you, however you want to call that. Okay, and um, you have 14 million scientists signed in right now. I think that's a fairly new number. Yeah. Right, and how many of these are coming every day? Well, it's, uh, yeah. it is, uh, it's a number. It's tough to say because we also, not everything you can consume in the network, you also can consume it via email, but I give you a different number which we track. Um, so if you look at the PubMed, it's a pretty large database for um, scientific research articles in the life science world. And if you take all the articles published in the last two years, 70% um, of the authors who published um, are a user of ResearchGate, from which uh, more half of them are logging in weekly. Okay. So it's a very active scientific social network where people really actively pushing the research updates they have into their projects to make them accessible to, um, to other scientists. I think the, the, the metrics you have in other social networks like in Facebook or LinkedIn where they measure you know, how many eyeballs you have, how long are you there, is, um, is not so important to us. Um, some scientists come back quarterly, some of them come monthly, daily. Um, it is really depending on are they coming back at all to get what they want, and that's what's happening at ResearchGate. And they're basically coming to, to, to consume content? Yes, okay. either share content or right. consume content. Okay. Yeah. So when, when we go back in your story, because I think this is rather interesting, it also tells us a lot about our country. So when you, when you think back, you had this idea. How did you have the idea? Um, again, I was in my lab, and it's not this Newton moment where you sit in evenings and you have like a candle and then you think about this Did idea. Did you actually have a candle in the lab? You can make the story up that I had a candle <laughs> in my lab, but I always thought about, hey, maybe I should shape the story differently. No, but um, it was, it's rather always a process um, where you like do stuff and you notice, hey, why is there not a social network for science, right? The World Wide Web was originally developed for scientists. Um, most people don't know. Um, you can buy shoes online today, but science hasn't changed over the last decade since we came. Um, but right, so you're giving back the internet to scientists. Exactly. Okay. Um, and when I, was a, when I was still doing research and finishing my medical um, career, and the idea came up together with my friend, I decided to build that research gate, and I was still working as a medical doctor. And then I decided to go to my um, professor, who I was working for, um, and I said, um, Professor Manns, I have an idea. I want to build up a social network for science. Can you give me like a half position? Um, he didn't like uh, the part-time position I wanted to have. He started yelling at me and said, get this furlough funds out of your head. Really? Um, he actually so yelled. <laughs> yes, he yelled, yes. 
Um, so I luckily did not get the furlifants out of my head, so I went out of the room of, the, of his office and then thought about it for 10 seconds, went back into the room and I said, uh, Professor Manz, I, and then I need to quit. So I okay, quit my job. What yeah. happened in your head? I mean, that's a rather big decision because you could have had a big career in, in this university, I yeah. guess. Yeah. I, honestly, I think making science in, as a whole more efficient, as, as I said, right, I want to win the Nobel Prize. So I always had in my, my, my head to do something big in this world, to do something good in this world. And I knew if we make all the science disciplines from chemistry to social science to physics to life science, if we make them all more efficient and more interdisciplinary, you can change a lot in this world. And I think that is way, in my opinion, I knew that I could do way more for science than just staying in my lab um, and doing there. I was anyways not the smartest in this lab. There were way better people to do the research I was doing. Um, so I uh, chose that way. And then you went home and told your parents, I just quit my job? Oh, yeah, that was, I told my brother, who wasn't right. so amused about that. <laughs> yeah, my brother is also a scientist, and he said, oh, why do you throw your career away? Um, now he goes to conferences and people ask him, hey, I know your name from somewhere. <laughs> and say, yeah, it's my brother, I always believed in him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. Yeah. But then... Finally, you found a fan. I mean, you found quite a few people who gave you millions to invest in your startup. And finally, you um, found a very prominent investor. You found Bill Gates. Mm -hmm. So how does a German entrepreneur meet, can meet Bill Gates? How does that work? Yeah, it, it starts a little bit earlier, right? The first investment round was Matt Kohler, um, who knows a lot of people. Then I, Peter Thiel invested in the second round. The third round was, you know, Matt asked me, who would you like to meet? And I said, ah. Oh, I think the next one would be Bill Gates. And he said, okay, that's even tough for me to organize. Um, so he then told me, um, yeah, I can find out if we know someone in his network. So he uh, called Boris, or he find out Boris, who is a scientific advisor of Bill. So I was talking to him on the phone, and he said, yeah, come over to Seattle, let's talk. So I flew to Seattle, I presented ResearchGate to him, and he said the first thing, ah, you know, Bill Gates doesn't have any time, and uh, he doesn't do any investment in tech startups, uh, your valuation is way too high, um, uh, but show me what you have. And I was like, what the heck? Right? You were flying like 14 hours to hear that. Nevertheless, I started presenting to him, and, and after a couple of minutes, he looked at his mobile phone, and he said, repeated the words again and again, he has to meet you, he has to meet you. And but what did you say? In, uh, what was, I want to uh, uh, get the Nobel Prize. No, I just showed him what the potential of ResearchGate is and showed what we already have built and showed him what the data is. So how fast we're growing, how active the platform is, how many um, research is being posted to ResearchGate. To give you one number, in the first four years, two and a half million data sets were published into ResearchGate, like raw data sets, negative failed experiments, etc. And now every three weeks, two and a half million are being uploaded. So you see that this growth, and this was at that, at that time, you already could see that this growth, growth is going to happen, that he was impressed by that. And then he asked me, okay, Bill Gates has to meet you. And it was quite complex because he asked me, where are you next week? Are you in Europe or in the US? And for, of course, I'm there where he is, but I was thinking, okay, we are right now in the US. He's asking me if I'm going to be in Europe or in US. He might think I'm going to fly to, back to Europe, so Bill might be in US. I'm going to answer US. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm go I think I'm going to be in the US. Ah, Bill is in Europe. Ah. <laughs> okay. So, so then I decided to fly to Europe to meet Bill. And, okay, and the, how was the meeting? The meeting was uh, fun. I've read you had the wrong computer with you. Yes, I uh, noticed when I was unfolding my laptop back um, that I brought my Mac with me. <laughs> um, and I opened the Mac and I was like, oh God, I'm sure you won't notice. Then we start presenting and at one point he... Um, he was very happy about it, and he liked the data, and he came to my laptop and he swiped from left to right. I was like, ah, Bill, that doesn't work. And he, <laughs> and he looked at it and said, oh, it's just a Mac. I said, yeah. <laughs> right, okay. Eventually, it worked out. Um, that was a big step for you guys. Um, um, I, would, I would be interested in, because Bill Gates is investing a lot in, in, in science um, um, ventures. So what is his strategy, and what can we maybe learn in Germany about what he's doing? Boah, that's a very tough question. You should ask him that. Um, I will definitely, I but he didn't come. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
No, I cannot speak for him, but if you look at all his um, endeavors and things he's working on, and like eradicating polio and, and trying to work on healthcare and make these things more efficient, of course, we work in a, in a very, like, we both um, support each other with the goals we have. So it is something which opening data, making science more open is something which supports all his um, um, projects. This is why I think it fits perfectly into his portfolio. So you both think um, science is the next field that is being disrupted by yeah. digital? Yeah, and I think that is um, happening already. And I think that is something which will make all our lives better. Okay, so give me an example. Yeah, so the, there's, um, there's one another example where, in general, Let's think about you as a scientist, right? If you have a lot of data and you try to do science, it is very tough if you don't have the whole view and the whole world in front of you. Um, if you don't see everything what you need in, in order to do research. Um, if we make this all open, that is the first part of the solution, right? But in order to make it even better for us, you, we have to help the human beings to analyze research. So I see open science as the one movement, but the next movement will be automatic science, where we start analyzing research data on its own, like automatically, and not everything is depending on a human being reading content and reading research data. So I think there would be a lot of, or there will be a lot of disruption happening in the next 10 years. There are already um, completely automated labs in the US? Yes. So yes. Will, will these lab um, people vanish? I think so, and also it's good for science if we have less people in the lab because then you, we eradicate more errors. If so you the science, okay, so the science yeah. of the future, uh, scientist of the future is the algorithm? Um, algorithm is a little bit too, let's say, we have to be broader. It's on the one hand, of course, the automation with some algorithms, yeah? But I, so I just give one example. Emerald Therapeutics um, has its own, they're building like an automa automized lab where you put a sample in and the samples then being generated and analyzed automatically. Um, again, a lot of data, but we need then, of course, algorithms, as you just said, to understand that data and to use that data in a way that it's still human readable and creates new knowledge out of that. And will these, these algorithms then work overnight and, and tell you in the morning, wow, I found out um, how to cure this uh, certain kind of cancer and try this medication? One day, yes, I believe so, yeah. It will, of course, it's not tomorrow, but I, one day, yes, I think, again, I said, it's so much data already available, and we, as human beings, we are ab absolutely incapable of digesting all right, this. Right, but also the, the algorithms are incapable because they are, these data are in different places. Yeah, so uh, but, as, as I, um, yeah but also we, were, we thought that um, algorithms are incapable of beating uh, a human being in Go, and now it the human being was better and go. So I think the, I think, on the one hand, ResearchGate is centralizing the information, right? Um, the people. So you will become the database for all this data um, that can be analyzed yes. in the future. Yes, and also everything is public. So everything what we at, re That's quite a broad at ResearchGate. Um, so everyone can access this data. It's already there, right? Um, and I think everyone can use the corpus and can use ResearchGate to do. Um, yeah, to use the algorithms. And that's also something we're looking into in the future, how we can yeah, build some sort of an stores, maybe the wrong word, but give access to outside scientists to operate on the data which is existing on ResearchGate. That is something we're also looking into. But what do we need scientists for when, when algorithms are doing the work? Check if everything is right. And also think but about how the can right they? questions. I mean, they can never see that much data. No, but you also still have to ask the questions, right? Someone right. has to ask the questions. Um, and I think that is still something which we all, you know, we cannot defer yet to the computer. But at one point, we have to ask the right questions to send the algorithm into a direction. Um, and I think that is where we still have some, something to do as human is beings. Is that a field for new startups as well? Yes, there are already a couple of startups. Um, I think it's still tough for an investment case. Um, yeah, but that is, again, I honestly, as you know, I only focus on research most of the time, even yeah. if you would say what's happening in science startups. I don't know, we right. just look at but, ourselves. But um, um, the business model, your business model is advertisement? Yes, if you, yeah, basically, yes. This is, uh, there are some people who say this is not really the future. Advertisement. Yeah, I would, again, in science, if you read a research item and we tell you, hey, that's the microscope XYZ from Carl Zeiss, and you want to buy that microscope, 
it's of course some sort of an advertisement, but again, it helps the scientists to do his research. So I think this whole topic around recruiting in science, conferences in science, um, lab products in science, all these different entities we can connect way better and uh, help the scientists to do his better work, and I think we can do, and we already have proven that we can do a lot of money with that. Okay, uh, do you earn money already? Uh, yes. So, um, are you profitable? Uh, no, not yet, okay. but soon. What, what does that mean? That's a good question. Okay. <laughs> so, we are going to talk again next year about that topic? Next year, yeah. Really good, okay. Um, um, wh one thing I would like to know is, when we think back um, about your professor from early times, did you ever meet him again after he yelled at you? So, four years ago, he signed up to ResearchGate. Really? Yes. Um, How did you find out about that? Did you uh, stalk him? No, 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 it was funny. We have in our office like a huge screen at the time where you see all the names. Looking for the professor. Okay. No, just look, like the names of right. people signing up in that second. Um, and then I was like saying, oh, Michael Mans? <laughs> so I was like, is, he really, is that really him? So I checked him out and said, yeah, it's his email address from a university. Um, and then a year later he approached me and said, hey, I would like to have you as a speaker at a conference. Okay. Um, and, the, and the one uh, fun note is... Um, that he was, I never mentioned or never said his name, right? I was always, um, I try not to mention his name, but um, the press always called him Professor Furlefanz. Um, and when I went to his conference, he introduced me and said, yeah, I didn't understand, yeah, thank you for coming. I didn't understand what you tried to achieve uh, with ResearchGate at the time. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, you went through walls, um, and I'm very proud to be Professor Furlefanz in the story. Um, so, yeah, and we're now friends. Really? Okay, yes. that's a really nice end of the story. Yeah. Thank you very much, Iyad Madish, and you. we will talk again next year. Thanks. Yes. Thank you.